Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. One gift that never gets returned? Trick question. It's three gifts, beer, wine, and spirits. And with Drizzly, you can send the gift of drinks right to your loved one's doors. Drizzly lets you compare prices from local liquor stores on a huge selection of beer, wine, and holiday spirits, then get them delivered right to that lucky someone's door in under 60 minutes. And right now, Drizzly is giving customers $5 off their first order. Just enter promo code JINGLE at checkout. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Ich warte seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb's sein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen. Hello and welcome to Gegen Pressing, the German football podcast from the Football Grad Network. I'm your host, Bryce Dunn. And joining me is Manu Vett. Manu, how have you been? I'm um, pretty good. It's nice to hear your voice, Bryce. Uh, have, you have you guys been? Have you guys been away? I, yeah, I don't know. We, have you? We had to record a podcast without you because I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> I, I, I thought the season must have ended. I, I stopped getting messages. You know, I just got yeah, pictures you, of uh, food and sports cars and football matches. I didn't, didn't know what happened. Uh, to be fair, you missed nothing. Now that's good. That's that's good. So I'm sure you guys could fill me in in the next next hour or so. Anyway. Yeah, that's the plan. I think that that's that's a good idea. <laughs> Joking aside, Manny, how was it? It sounds like you guys had a tremendous time. Yeah, we had a blast. It was it was incredible. Um, I think the the last week or so has been. I mean, Chris, Chris said it was one of the most incredible weeks of German football we had. Um, he might be right. It was absolutely incredible. So, yeah, we had a blast. Awesome. That's great to hear. Yeah, the photos look good and the reporting was fantastic, guys. Oh, well done. It's, it's a real shame I didn't make it. But obviously, let's, let's get Chris's opinion on it as well. Chris, welcome back, I suppose, to um, the UK. Um, did you have a, a great time? Uh, yes. Not to rub salt into your open wounds, Bryce, because you didn't make it. But yeah, it, we had a oh. fantastic time. It was, um, yeah, I would like to say last year was just as good when you were there. But yeah, this year we'll take some beating next season. All right, guys. All right. I think I think we need to stop <laughs> rubbing this thing. Come on, come on. Well, you know what? It's it's been nice weather over here, so you know it it hasn't been all doom and gloom for me. That that's all I've got to say about that. Let, let's talk football. Most of the season had been wrapped up domestically, hadn't it? There was only one thing left to play for when it came to the Bundesliga anyway, and that was who was going to go down and who was going to go up, featuring Wolfsburg and Holsten Kiel. So both teams had finished third, but one third from bottom and one third from top. Uh, after the first leg, um, it's seen Wolfsburg take a 3-1 advantage. Then we've seen the return leg in Kiel, Unfortunately for Kiel, not go too well as they lost 1-0. That keeps Wolfsburg in the division for at least another season. Uh, Chris, uh, let's start by talking about the first leg. Um, apparently, it was an incredible atmosphere. Um, how did the game go and uh, how much did you enjoy it? Oh, well, yes, let's start with the atmosphere. It, it was a tremendous atmosphere. I've been to Wolfsburg a couple of times now. I think that was my, might be my third or fourth trip. Um, and I said to Manu in the stadium, I've never heard it as loud as we heard it that day. Uh, it was tremendous. Um, and that was from both sets of fans. I think it helped that that's one of the first times I've been to the Volkswagen Arena where it's been a complete sellout. I think that really helped the atmosphere. Um, the game itself was tremendous. It was end to end. Normally they're a very cagey affair with uh, neither side looking to make the first mistake, let alone score the first goal. But uh, Wolfsburg pressed from the off, and surprisingly, um, so did Kiel. But I think throughout this whole season, that's the way they've played, and that's why obviously they scored 71 um, goals in Bundesliga 2, you know, the top scorers, um, I think, throughout that entire league. And it was it showed how they could do that, the way they attacked. I thought they just lacked that little bit of, of class, really. 
um, to get more than the breakthrough they did, but they did really, really push. I mean, I know Mano will probably cover it, but the last quarter of that game, um, they were well on top at times. But Wolfsburg's class did just show through. Um, but like last season, I was there for last season's game. What of the season following? I think everybody expected them to do a lot better in 2017-18. They didn't. They ended up in the same position. Uh, it would be a disaster if they um, ended up there um, this time next year. I think three seasons on the trot in the relegation playoff would be would be terrible. However, um, they've got a new man in his seat. Manu's best friend. I got a picture with him. Manu and I are at the uh, El Freunde party. Which is, if you don't know, that's a pretty much a German equivalent of 442. Um, massive football magazine. Um, both Manu, Manu and I were um, invited over, which was fantastic. And Manu had his picture taken with her schmacker. I was the photograph, uh, photographer of the night, apparently. I didn't know until he said, take a picture quick. Um, so I did. Um, but, yeah, they've got some changes coming through. Um, I think it's likely Divock Origi will leave, which um, I think must frustrate um, and please the Wolfsburg fans because on the whole he was pretty poor. But the last couple of match days he showed his real worth, which I think is, is hard for any fan to take because... Had he played at the top of his level throughout the entire season, they may not have been in the situation they were in. But obviously, it's more fault than his. Um, but yeah, changes need to happen, Manu, don't they? Yeah, definitely changes they need to happen massively at this club. I think it was it was in February that I that I that I told you guys that um, the numbers revealed that their salary is is about the salary structure is about the same than Atletico Madrid. It's the fourth biggest salary in in German football, and yet two time, two seasons in a row, they have finished sixteenth. And I think, I mean, this is something that we discussed quite a bit before the game, and something that also came up among most fans um, that a lot of people in Germany kind of hoped that they would go down, um, follow Hamburg, right? Because they seemed almost like a rotten apple a little bit in this league, um, a team that was very poorly run, um, put together. Various pieces, various players that did not fit um, the squad very well. So you know there was there was almost this conception uh, in all of Germany that the all of Germany wanted to get to go down. And remember that the, the, one of the the capos um, in front of the Wolfsburg fan stands is screamed out, "All of Germany wants us to go down today, and we're going to show them that we won't." And in the end, that's exactly what Wolfsburg did. But that doesn't take away from the fact that. I think that they need some some house cleaning at that club, um, and that has to start, of course, with the decision makers. And the decision makers are the, the Volkswagen Group, you know, the, the world's largest car maker. Um, and I think, you know, Chris, and, Chris, you and I, we walk through the city of Wolfsburg. The city of Wolfsburg, rather being the car plant, the Autostadt, and a couple of nice hotels, it's very much a prestige object for the for the for the company. And therefore, it's going to be very important that um, the club kind of highlights that, you know, and reflects the, the, the car manufacturer positively. So I res- expect that there's going to be quite a lot of changes. Yeah, Mario, I was just about to ask, do you see there being a likelihood of uh, uh, of changes throughout the summer? And where do you see the changes being? I mean, uh, how far into the decision makers at the club do you see, well, them being maybe booted out or changed or the thought process changing? Is is it likely to happen? Well, the number one question is the coach, right? Bruno Labbadia, he's now done what he does best. He, he's very good at saving clubs. He's done it with Hamburg. Um, he's now done it with Wolfsburg. The question is, is he going to be a long-term solution for the club? And if the if Schmatke, of course the sporting director and sporting directors in German football like to bring their own head coaches, um, if he decides to bring in a new head coach, he has to do it right away. The the, the season, of course, um, in July we're basically back in the training camps, right? Um, by then a new manager, a head coach has to be installed, and with him a new philosophy has to be brought in, and with that new philosophy, new players. There will be a bunch of players that will want to leave the club after playing against relegation for two seasons. And then there will be a bunch of players that will no longer be needed, but will have to leave the club in order for the Wolfsburg to move forward. And 
those decisions can only be made once you have a head coach. So I think that's really the number one question. Is Bruno Labbadia the man to take this club forward? I think on a personal level, I think that Bruno Labbadia is a very good coach. But then you also heard things like Ralf Hasenhüttl being wanted by Wolfsburg. Now, of course, Hasenhüttl, um, that was the big news last week, of course, that he was, that he in Leipzig parted ways. Um, and he has now said that he doesn't want to take a job this season. So I think that is, there is an indication right there that maybe Wolfsburg are going to take a different coach. But all these things have to happen fast because, I mean, Chris, the, the coach is the number one, one number one man when it comes to becoming putting together a squad and putting together a philosophy. Yeah, yeah, it is. You're quite right. And they need to get that in place quickly. And um, We've seen in the past, Bundesliga clubs tend to make the decisions early. Now, be that mid-season or the end of season, and that's purely because um, if they want to get a coach in, they need to be able to work the entire training camp. And you quite rightly said that'll start around about July. Um, and players coming back from the World Cup um, you know, we'll, we'll need a little bit of rest. So, um, you know, coaches have got a hard job as it is. So if they're going to bring someone in, he needs to bring it in now, really, within the next couple of weeks um, in order that they can start to plan because Wolfsburg need some planning, some long-term planning. They need to sit down and, and work out where the club needs to be, what a realistic aim is. Um, they need to strip out any unrealistic aims. I think, you know, any notions of the Europa League is probably um, a step way too far. If, if I was the... Um, your staff over at Wolfsburg will be identifying a decent cup run in the Pokal and finishing somewhere around about 8th or ninth. I think that would be an excellent season for them compared to the last couple and then they could build from that. Um, you know, and we've seen in in the winter time that um, Bundesliga coaches, uh, sorry, Bundesliga teams, if they're going to get rid of a coach, they do it very close to the winter break so the coach, the new coach then has the winter break to, to try and sort out the, the team and that's why I think they need to act fast. Um, You've managed to said that Labadia, whilst he's good at saving clubs, that's probably his um, his best asset. Now, were he to lead Wolfsburg next season, um, you know, would he would he then take them into a situation where they'd need to be saved? And you know, would he be the man to do it? That's probably not the avenue that they want to go down. So it's going to be a difficult one for them. Um, they look to be at times throughout that season, especially when I saw them play against Eintracht Frankfurt. They look to be eleven individuals on the pitch now. Uh, that changed significantly last week. Um, they looked like a really good team um, that could play through the lines, especially of Kiel. Now, I think Kiel were a little guilty of, of some poor marking, but for that particular fixture and, and the couple before it, Wolfsburg did look a lot better. So there are building blocks there for them to go on. It's just whether they can do it quickly. I mean, if we get to some time round about, I'd say, middle of June and they haven't replaced a coach, it's going to be a real test for them because then there's only four to five weeks until the players come back in. They really need to have some sort of pre-season or full-season plan drawn up by them. Well, the, the real danger is, too, when last season, of course, um, Andres Jonker saved the club. And there were some real doubts on whether he would be the man to carry them, carry them into the new season. And then, more or less by compromise they decided to hang on to him and build a new side around him as and that ended up being a major problem because of course he plays possession based football he plays a, a very very dutch style of football and so they they brought in the players for him that that, that could work that that style and the problem of course was that Within a few match days, they realized, okay, well, this is not how we want to how, how we want to have the club moving forward. So they brought in Martin Schmidt, who plays a very different style of football. So I think that is the big danger. Um, I think if they wanna if they wanna really make a change in that position, and will have to be now because last year that of course caused the chain events that led into playing a relegation playoff for the second year in a row, despite having the fourth largest budget in German football. So. I think that's really the, the the key aspect for Jörg Schmatke. And I think once he's decided that, Jörg Schmatke is one of those sporting directors that are famous for identifying players and um, players that no one else, and Earth's players that no one else has looked at before and bring them into his sides. He's, of course, the architect behind the, the Köln squad that reached the Europa League uh, the previous season, and he did very good work at Hannover and Alemannia Aachen before that, 
So he's a he's a very intelligent uh, sporting director, and I'm saying that not just because I got his picture taken with me. It's it's he's a very very good sporting director, and it's going to be very interesting what he's going to do with the amount of resources that he now has at his disposal, because this is a lot more money has he has at his disposal now than he had in all his three previous clubs. Guys, I think we need to ask the question whether uh, Peter Stoger would, would would he do a job there? What do you think, Chris? Um. Bless him, no. Um, I think Peter Stoke has had a bit of a poor season uh, with Cologne. And then I know he steered Borussia Dortmund back into the Champions League, but you know, on reflection, it wasn't a particularly good time of his there. So he may be one of the managers that takes a little break next season. I don't think he would be the immediate answer um, for me for Wolfsburg. Yeah, also him and Jörg Schmatke don't get along. That was one of the reasons, one of the things that happened last summer that Köln's management kind of failed to identify is that there was a real break between Stöger and Schmatke during that summer. And that's how things became unhinged at Köln, um, because they didn't agree necessarily on how to put the squad together. So I think um, Stöger and Schmatke, despite them having four good years together at Köln, will not be working together in the near future. No, probably not. Um, guys, then I, I feel that we need to talk about uh, not just uh, the second leg, but, uh, well, I suppose a little bit about the second leg. I mean, I, I watched this game uh, as, as well, and um, it, as much as you you can look at the stats and say, well, Kiel went toe-to-toe with them, they never really looked like uh, mounting a comeback, did they? And I suppose that brings us to the question about whether this uh, relegation playoff is a good thing or a bad thing. And Chris, uh, let's go to you first. I mean, would you say just three up, three down, or do you enjoy the kind of um, the, the cup final um, atmosphere of these two legs? I enjoy it. I, I think the relegation playoff is something that makes this league unique. I know it's not gone well for those in the lower division against the, you know, against the main Bundesliga side. Um, and that go some way even in the other relegation uh, games that go on between the other leagues. So it can be seen as maybe a bit divisive, but I, if I was going to do any changes to it, I'd make it a one-off game at a neutral venue. Now, uh, where that neutral venue would be is probably somewhere in between them both. If I was to use Alan Partridge's term, I would say it'd be equidistant uh, between both grounds. So that would be one option for me. Uh, otherwise, I'd it's pretty boring. Three up, three down is pretty boring, really. I know it's the best way to do everything, but there needs to be some sort of um, some sort of, of playoff. Now, the only other way to do that, three up, three down, would be if the top three in the Bundes sorry, if the bottom three in the Bundesliga were relegated, you would get the top two and one other. Now, in England, the way that works is you work all the way down to six. Now, don't forget the Bundesliga two has um, a couple of less teams in it, so if you're going down to six, you're not far off. Um, the mid table, and you know, if you look at third and then go down and you know another six after that, that's ninth. That would be a real bad idea. There's teams in that league, you know, at ninth who won the last week in the Bundesliga. So I don't think that's the way. I think this is, is the best way for me. Uh, bottom, the third place bottom side plays the third place top side um, in their respective leagues. But I think it should be a one off game at a neutral venue to give it a real cup final feel because I do feel that if um, if it was a different ground, and Wolfsburg didn't have the backing that they had the other night, and Kiel maybe had a more heavier backing, maybe half the stadium like you would get at a neutral venue, I think the result might have been different, especially in the last 10 minutes. Manu, what about you? I mean, if, what's your view on on the relegation playoff? And I suppose, what, what's the view of the Bundesliga fans within Germany? How, how do they see, see this? Are they in favour or, or largely against it? I think um, I, I love watching it um, if your team is not in it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great spectacle if your team isn't in it. It's nowhere else is um, joy and agony so close together. Um, and there, there is something to be said about that. The drama is uncomparable to anything else. I think it's even more traumatic in some ways than an actual cup final because... 34 games, a 34 game season is on the line. And that's, that, there is something to be said about that, right? So as a, as a, someone watching it, as a neutral watching it, I think in terms of drama, it's, it's unbeatable. But I think there's also an injustice about it. Now you're Holstein Kiel. 
And when I was a kid growing up, the the bottom three would go down and the top three go would go up. Um, it was only in the 1980s and then, of course, in the 2000s when they brought it back that we had promotion relegation playoffs. And I think there's there's something to be said about that. If out of 34 games you finish in the top three, you have proven that you belong in that top three echelon um, of the second division. The only reward, in my opinion, could be to go straight up. Um, and I think the same has to be said. If if you bottle it after 34 games in the Bundesliga, I mean, there is no coincidence that Wolfsburg were now in that situation twice. And previously, Hamburg, right, who have finally gone down this year, they have been in the relegation playoffs on several occasions. So maybe there's a, maybe they, it would be more just to say, okay, after 34 games, you've bottled it. Um, the table doesn't lie in, in that regard. Down you go, right? Um, I like Chris's idea of a one-off game. I think it gives the lower division side a lot more chance. Over one and one game, a lot of things can happen. Um, over two games, it's a lot more difficult. It becomes tactical. It becomes the away goal of us all of a sudden plays a plays a role. Um, there's all these little factors that can come into it. But over 90 minutes, or let's say 120 minutes plus penalties in a one-off game, I think these lower division sides have a bigger chance because anything can happen in that one game. Um, there's an, and then there wouldn't be a way for the, the bigger side to fix their mistakes from the first leg. So I think that you know if you if you keep the promotion relegation, I like that idea. Play it, play it in Berlin. I mean that stadium could be could be losing their um, their main host anyways because Hertha of course want to build a stadium outside of the Olympia Stadium, which is something we discussed in the in last week's podcast. So play it in Berlin. Um, I think that'd be that'd be great. Add another another cup final so to say to the list of cup finals yeah fantastic yeah fantastic for atmosphere i suppose maybe holson keel can feel hard done by but that's the way it goes for now yeah be interested to see how they get on next season with a new coach but let's go from uh, one final i suppose to the dfb pokal final Guys, um, we were seeing uh, the Nico Kovac uh, final in, in a way, as he's going to be joining uh, Bayern Munich um, next season. But he's um, steered Eintracht Frankfurt all the way to the final. Obviously, Bayern would have been heavy favourites going into this, um, but you two managed to to get in. You you attended, and I suppose we got to start. Um, well, we'll start with you, Chris, and ask what was the atmosphere like inside the ground. Well, <clears throat> from um, six minutes, 30 seconds, when we got into the ground, the atmosphere was rocking. So, um, unfortunately, Manu and I didn't get accreditation from the DFB, so we managed to get a couple of tickets outside. Um, now, anyone that's been to a major final in any country will tell you that if you want to get tickets outside, they are maybe four to five times their resale value. However, once that whistle goes for kickoff, they're pretty much worthless bits of paper and um, we took advantage of that situation and ended up getting them for half the price, well, just just um, just over half the price. So by the time we got in, we'd missed um, Robert Lewandowski hit the bar, um, but we took our seats just in time for the first goal. But the atmosphere was incredible um, from from then on, um, especially in Frankfurt and a little more subdued in the Bayern end. We were um, on one of the Bayern sides. Um, of the stadium, although it was it was quite a mixed area, but it was predominantly by inside, uh, and they weren't particularly happy. Maybe frustrations shown from there. Can we call it a disappointing season? Just winning one trophy out of three, I think we can really. Um, their frustrations were were apparent, uh, especially the very nice guy and his wife who was sat next to Manu, and um, they were having some heated conversations <laughs> in, in German, and it was nice to see. But the Frankfurt guys, I mean. In the, the event we went to the night before, they were all saying they were going to get battered. They thought they were going to get battered. Uh, and I, I had a sneaky feeling they'd win 2-1, which was almost right, wasn't it? It was about 10 seconds um, ten seconds too soon. But yeah, on the whole, the atmosphere was very, very good. Um, it was very, very loud. We were at the top, uh, near the top of the stadium. Obviously, the Olympic Stadion roof uh, makes the acoustics even better. So... Yeah, the atmosphere was, was second to none. It was um, certainly one of the best games I've been to in recent years for atmosphere uh, across the whole of Germany. Yeah, it's a very special atmosphere, not just inside the stadium. I thought 
throughout the day in Berlin, um, we we went throughout the city. We went to Alexanderplatz where the the Bayern fans congregated. Um, walked through the through Mitte, um, where by the Hackische Höfe, and everywhere you could see people with their scarves, um, Bayern scarves, Eintracht Frankfurt scarves. Of course, we met a bunch of uh, fans from both camps at the uh, Freunde party the night before. Um, Chris is quite right. Frankfurt fans were very optimistic ahead of the match. Then, of course, the the fan, both fan camps, and I think this is this is something quite unique for Germany that you had the both fan camps, um, fans from Frankfurt and Bayern, take the S-Bahn out to the Olympiastadion together, and I, I suspect it was the same with the U-Bahn. There's, of course, an S-Bahn line that goes to the Olympiastadion and an U-Bahn line, and we ended up taking the S-Bahn, um, so the suburban train, and there was fans from both camps and they were chatting to each other they were discussing Nico Kovac they were discussing Lukas Radetzky and his future they were discussing um, just the the outlook of the game and the general feeling and there there was a little bit of friendly banter and I mean actual friendly banter um, between the fans and it, it was really neat and I think you know Chris you and I were chatting about that we, of course, have seen many other fan cultures around the world, and that seems to be something really quite unique that, you know, this is, this is ahead of a major final between two clubs that have some, so, have some rivalry, and yet at the same time, um, that rivalry really seems to remain just in the grounds and among, you know, in, in each side of the stands, but on the way there and on the way out, there was no trouble at all, which was fantastic. Yeah, it was a definitely a split from last year because obviously I attended the final last year, um, and there was various stations dedicated for each um, for each club. So I travelled with a number of Dortmund supporters, and we went to one particular um, S-Bahn station and were told by the police that you know under no circumstances were we allowed in. This is for Frankfurt fans only. So I think that was relaxed a little this year. And you're quite right; the train was um, very friendly. Uh, we got off at the Olympic Stadium, worked up the steps. You know, it was a sea of red and white mixed. Um, you know, white of Frankfurt, red of, of um, Bayern Munich. And then even even for last year, once you got off, you were signalled to various entrances. I remember, Manu, if, if you got off, when we got off the train, we just decided to go left. Now, that wasn't an option. Um, last year, you were either told to go left or right, depending on what coloured shirt you had on. So it was nice to see that. And not that there was any trouble last year that I certainly saw anyway, and I didn't see any this season. And I think that was a nice touch, and it added to the atmosphere outside. There was just people mingling, having a good time, drinking, you know, outside the ground, um, drinking on the way up. I mean, it was real relaxed. Just people having a very, very nice day out on what was a beautiful day in Berlin. Well, firstly, we need to get to the bottom of this, Manu. What were they? What were the couple beside you arguing about? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you know the the tickets that Chris and I actually bought, they were from the couple that were sitting next to us, and they sold them outside the ground after getting the tickets for free because the the nice gentleman was a has been a buy-in season ticket holder since 1973, so he ended up getting the tickets for free and then managed to sell uh, the two tickets that Chris and I bought for a very large sum, and then Chris and I ended up buying them for 60 euros each. And um, he asked us what we were doing. We said, well, we're journalists. We're here reporting on the match. And um, we, we were kind of let down by the DFB. They didn't let us in. They didn't accredit us. So this was our only way in and to actually report on this match. And we chatted. And he said, well, he was so glad that he, he managed to sell those tickets for the exuberant amount of money. And then in the end, it ended up with two guys that really needed the tickets, and they actually got it for a very good price. So it, that was the first thing we talked about. Um, but yeah, he's he just said that you know he's been a Bayern Bayern supporter his entire life. Uh, was a real Bavarian guy too. You know, when you when you go to Bayern games, especially away from Munich, you, uh, most of the Bayern supporters that you seem to see around you are not actually from Munich. So he was actually a guy from Munich, which which is a seldom occurrence at times. So that was really nice. So we chatted about it, and he was he said, of course, you know, Bayern win so many titles um, that he he almost was just there to watch a great final. And uh, in the end, he was of course upset that Bayern didn't win it, but he also said, of course, that um, this was one of the best finals he's ever seen because both teams played football. So that was a lot of the things that we are discussed. But there was also 
he just was very interested in what we were doing, you know, was very interested in the opinions Chris and I had and um, the way we viewed the match. So he was just, I think he was just very interested um, in what we, how we viewed the game. And so that was most of the discussions were just very friendly. He was very interested in how we viewed um, the two contentious decisions. Yeah, he was. But I think we have to get to that at some point uh, later in the podcast, Chris. <laughs> well, well, let's, uh, guys, let's talk about the game then. Um, we'll, we'll go to you, Chris. Um, I, I mean, yeah, an unexpected result. I'm sure we can get to it in time as well. That It may be a disappointing season uh, by uh, Bayern Munich. But um, how exactly did the game pan out? I mean, the obviously, Eintracht took the lead. Uh, one nil. Then there was a, an equaliser just after half time by Bayern. But um, yeah, after being two one up, your prediction there was a breakaway goal right at the end with the keeper out of position. Um, yeah, tell us the story of how the game went. And so was it uh, Kovac's um, tactical decisions that that really swung it? I don't know if it was tactical decisions that swung it. I think he'd fired his players up for this final because, as Manu and I mentioned in last week's podcast, this was everything for him. If he'd have walked into that Bayern dressing room as a loser, um, as the new coach, I think that may have started his tenure off in the most negative way, undermined instantly. If they'd been battered 4 or 5 nil. he walks into that dressing, gra- uh, dressing room, he tries and, and implements some new tactics and the players go, what do you know, the last time we saw each other, we battered you 5 nil. so how about you listen to us? This time, you know, he can slam his medal down on the table and say, we're going to do things my way because I've shown that I can, uh, you know, take this club to town if I want to. So I think he'd fired his players up well. Uh, we'd seen throughout the whole of last season that when on their day, Frankfurt were exceptionally well. They had a little wobble towards the end of the season, but just don't disregard that. For the rest of the season, they were excellent. Um, and they played very quick, very intricate passing football, which is what sort of undid Bayern. Now, I think Bayern sort of undid themselves a little bit for the first goal, but it was the quick responses and the quick reactions that enabled Rebic to go in and, and fire in what was a beautiful goal for the Bayern's first, uh, sorry for Frankfurt's first goal. But then Bayern missed a multitude of chances. I can think of three off the top of my head. Lewandowski went close. Um, I think Boateng went close, Hummels even went close at one point, and there were three key areas, but Frankfurt also um, missed one them, themselves. I think it was about a foot and a half um, away from a goal, just needed to get some studs on it, and it didn't go in. So I think at the at the half-time waypoint, it was a pretty equal game, but it was, an, uh, it was a frustrating day, I think, if you're a Bayern fan, because the football was there in bursts but it wasn't there for us all to see I think a little like the two Champions League games we saw where on the whole you'd say Bayern deserved to go through but when it came to the crunch the level of football just wasn't there and I think you can say all you want about the the second goal but at the end of the day it was a brilliantly executed pass and then the touch and the finish was was world class it was a fantastic finish Um, and that I think sort of broke Bayern um, and obviously they were searching desperately for an equaliser. I think I will leave the penalty to Manu to talk about. Um, but you know, from the corner they break away and score, and and it was just an astonishing end to an astonishing game. And everybody around us was was saying that was probably the best final they've seen for years. And for as long as I've been watching German football, that is easily the best final I've seen for a long time. And just glad enough to be in the stadium to take it all in because. As Manu wrote on Twitter afterwards, there was people crying in the stands behind Frankfurt fans. And I'm not on about, you know, I'm not on about um, young lads. I'm on about 27 to, I mean, it must have been 27 to 35. And they were big lads, looked like they went to the gym a lot, Bryce, a little bit like you, big beard. And, and they were in floods of tears. So I think it was really nice that we were able to see what it meant to the fans and the, and the whole city of Frankfurt to win the game. But, you know, on the whole, what was the game like in a snapshot? It was a very, very good game. Uh, and it could have it could have gone either way in the end, but Frankfurt just uh, marched away with it with a great solo goal at the end. It was a very intense game. In, in a lot of ways, it was typical Kovac football. And yeah, I was very surprised that he managed to put a stamp on this match. I mean, there was, there was one stat that was tweeted out by our friend Mark Lovell um, that Bayern had 77% of the possession. It didn't seem like that when you were 
when you when you didn't have the tactic or statistics boards in front of you, it, it didn't feel like that. Um, Frankfurt did not seem like a team that was outplayed by Munich. They they were very intense, and every time that they managed to get a hold of the ball, they were very quick in breaking forward. And yes, they may have had the ball last, but what they did revert, and this is this is something that you love to say, Chris, right? It doesn't matter how long, much you have the ball; it depends what you do with it. And I think Frankfurt was just better better on the ball. They were just a lot more efficient, and I, I felt that every time they had the ball, they were there was danger in that side. There was purpose in that side there was that mentality that now we got it now we have to do something with it and i think it was about halfway through the first half when i when i notched you and said it was a big mistake to play thiago and hummus together in that 4-3-3 for bayern because they were of course right in front of harvey martinez in, in this triangle in midfield but both of them like to really hold on to the ball so Whereas Frankfurt, when they got the ball, they were, the movement was right away forward. For Bayern, the movement was always parallel. It was sideways, a pass here, holding onto the ball there, maybe playing even back to Harvey Martinez. There wasn't a sense of, now we got the ball, now we have to move forward quick. It was too possessive almost of the ball. And I think Heinkes, he tried to rectify that. I think it was around the 60th minute when Tulisu came on, a more dynamic, more attacking-minded midfielder. I mean, don't mean attack that Thiago and Hamza are not attacking-minded, but someone who uses his athleticism to quickly break forward. And I think that was maybe one of the mistakes that Heinke has made. And I think he, he, he made this mistake because I think he thought that Kovac is going to play in his usual 3-5-2, but Kovac surprised everyone and played 4-3-3 with Boateng as a holding striker up front. Um, some who could then also drop back and play play almost like a number ten at times, and I think with with that way Frankfurt was really able to amass numbers in midfield and really hold Bayern to that midfield areas, and I thought that was quite fascinating. Yeah, it was, and I think everyone was surprised by the form, not the form, sorry, the, the formation, not the personnel they went with, but the formation especially. I mean, once we got in and sat down, I was unsure if they were actually playing a 4-3-3 because I thought, no, I don't think you do that. It doesn't normally go that way. But I think he took he took the game to Bayern. He knew how they would potentially line up and he thought, you know what, we're gonna, I'm going to beat you at your own game here. And I thought the three midfielders that um, Frankfurt went with, and I wouldn't say they outclassed, but they certainly outplayed the three. Um, and you're quite right. It was, it was, I don't think it was attacking enough. And when Toliso came on, it sort of lent itself a little bit more to buy an attack, which is probably why for the last 15 minutes or so, they really, really pushed for that um, you know, equalising goal um, or even to take the uh, lead at some point. Because Frankfurt were a little bit on the back foot at times where once Toliso came on, because I think that allowed the freedom of the midfield. But when the game started, I even thought that maybe the back four for Frankfurt were just a little bit more... Um, Compass Mentis on the day. I mean, we had Kimmich in front of us. He was on our side, and the amount of poor touches he had and gave the ball away it was very similar to that game um, that Germany played against Spain, and he was roasted by you know on that side by Iniesta. Now, he wasn't particularly hung out to dry as much on this day, but on that side he had real problems, and I thought that sort of summed up Bayern's day um, really. And you know, both Williams and uh, even De Costa on the side had better time at the back and. Then I think the the front three of Frankfurt played really really well. I mean, don't you can't take Rebic's two goals away from them. They were fantastic. Um, I thought Boateng and even Wolf from when he was on the pitch, I thought he played exceptionally well. And some days when you're playing football, you just have one of those matches where everything comes together and your entire eleven have a very good game. There wasn't one member of that Eintracht Frankfurt side where at the end of the match you could say actually he had a pretty poor game because I thought they all played very very well. Yeah, we need to talk about that Rebic goal. Um, the the first one, of course, was great, but the second one was probably the most emotional goal I've ever seen in the stadium, because Boateng placed that ball, and I think I was I was hanging off your shirt with my hand and saying, "He's gonna score! He's gonna score! He's gonna score!" And you could see it when he ran towards Ulreich's goal. There, there was almost no doubt in anyone's mind he's gonna put that away, um, but he ran almost halfway across the field. And 
he left two defenders in the dust that are going to feature in, in Germany's World Cup squad this summer. That was it. That first goal was great, but that second goal was absolutely tremendous. Just the, the purpose and uh, I think Ante Rebic's performance on that night um, was absolutely unbelievable. And it also, for that goal, was a good um, introduction if you've never seen what adrenaline can do to the system because he had run nearly the full length of that pitch to score that goal. Um, he'd sprinted out early and he'd taken the ball down well and he probably still had about 45 yards of running before he slotted that ball away. But then he hopped the barrier and ran the extra bit of distance all the way to the crowd as well. So I'm sure he must have been a bit tired after that because it was a fantastic goal, but the adrenaline carried him on. Um, obviously, we went to VAR, but there was no trouble in the end of it. And I'm glad because I think that would have really spoiled the moment. And looking back on it, especially the next day, it's, not, it's got to be a clear and deliberate error and it's got to be a clear and deliberate reason. And that wasn't an intentional handball for me. So that particular VAR call, I think, was spot on. It wouldn't be the holiday season if there wasn't candy, right? Celebrate the holiday season with the Holiday Crush. They've sprinkled candy with a holiday theme and fun-packed challenges every week for five whole weeks, finishing on January 4th. The more challenges you complete, the better your chances of unwrapping delicious rewards. So, are you ready to crush the holidays? Play the Holiday Crush now. Download it from the App Store, Google Play, or Windows Store for free. Terms and conditions apply. Well, that, that's exactly what I was going to move to, Chris. Um, uh, I suppose, Manu, uh, what's your opinion on the, the VAR mishaps and the uh, the Bayern penalty claim? I think these are uh, are issues that um, we're going to have to talk about. And VAR has come up quite a few times in this podcast this season, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, Cortina's Erwin, um, the, the big refereeing block um, in Germany, uh, put out a tweet on Twitter saying, of course, it was a, a mistake, but why it should have been. He should have given the the penalty. But if it was a mistake, but why it was probably the most just mistake in the history of football. And now this is coming from a refereeing uh, block because personally, I I'm a big fan of VAR. I'm a big fan that um, they can the referees can look at their decision a second time. But Bayern did not deserve the title that night. Um, Bayern fans are going to be up in arms, of course, now when they listen to this podcast. I, I stick to that decision, and I, I really think that Bayern simply didn't deserve it that night. And um, maybe there's some poetic justice to it, too, because Zweier was, of course, also the referee that made several mistakes in Bayern's victory um, over RB Leipzig back in, I believe this was... Um, around the time that Heinkes came in, so October, November, right? Um, in, in the cup as well. So, you know, sometimes things come back at you to haunt you. And of course, you also have to remember that Bayern um, won two cup finals against Dortmund, one of which uh, where Mats Hummel scored a goal and it wasn't given because the ball had clearly crossed the line, but we didn't have the goal line technology back then. And um, the following year, Ribéry completely took out uh, Gonzalo Castro and was not shown a red card. Sometimes things like that come back to you to haunt you. And I think in that particular night, that's exactly what happened, and I, I do stick to that. I think it's probably the most just missed call in German football. Um, of course, that doesn't take away from the actual VER debate. Zweier um, said to Süddeutsche Zeitung today that he, he sticks to his decision, that he saw the replay, and he did not think that Boateng's movement um, was intended to be a foul and therefore no penalty. Now, he, that to me is a human error, right? And he sticks to his decision, the decision he made on the pitch. And then later when he rewatched the, the, the review area, when he rewatched the, the video, um, I think that is one thing that VAR just can't take away. In the end of the day, it's still humans looking at a decision, right? And that this, at that point, he was looking at it while there was um, several thousand fans screaming. I think we, it's very easy for us to make, to say in front of a television screen or from the stands, okay, this decision is an easy one to make, but at the end of the day, referees are human beings and they have to make the decisions 
and they have to make the decisions uh, quickly, even with the video. Um, has he made the wrong decision on this one? Yeah, maybe. Um, he maybe did, but I think um, as a whole, and there was recently numbers pushed out by in, from Italy, the Gazzetta dello Sport. As a whole, VR, there isn't without a doubt, VR has worked. Um, there is less diving in football. There is less wrong decisions made in terms of penalties. Less wrong decisions made in terms of goals. Um, there is less play acting in general in football. I think those two numbers already sell it to me. Less play acting and diving. Um, if we are, can, can significantly eliminate that, that's already a win. Um, will the game therefore be perfect? I don't think so. And I think there will be still a lot more growing pain, um, until the system really works. VAR is inherently a problem because it's um, it's another opinion. Now, whether that opinion sits in Cologne or whether it goes back to referee on the pitch, yeah. it's still an opinion. The goal line system is a beauty because it's black and white. The whole of the ball either crosses the line or it doesn't. That's why you know when when we see it, it can come down to you know a third of a centimeter. If that ball isn't all the way over the line, it's not a goal, and and that's why that system works so well and it's so quick. Now. He didn't just take one look at it. I mean, he was there for, I mean, it felt like a good minute. I know it wasn't a good, um, it wasn't a minute. But if you look at the replay on the television, uh, there's actually a fantastic camera angle that shows he watches the, the, the movement of the foot and the connection. He watches it five or six or seven times. Uh, and he watches it over and over again. Now, it would be interesting to see what the VAR advice was. I've not managed to catch that um, in the days after whether the advice was it was a penalty or not, and then he's gone over and had a look. But the rules of the game or the laws of the game state that the referee has to be 100% convinced. If he's not 100% convinced, he can't give the penalty. That's the laws of the game. So if he sees it and he's not 100% convinced, then it's his opinion. And, you know, he's passed many a refereeing course. He's had many assessments, and that's his, that's his opinion. And he decides it's not a goal. Uh, sorry, if he decides it's not a penalty... It's not a penalty. Now, that doesn't make it any easier to take because it's clear that the kick impedes the player and he goes down. Whether he goes down a bit theatrically is another matter uh, which may not have got worked in his favour. But at the end of the day, the referee called it. He doesn't think it's a penalty and it's not given. And, you know, and I think the, the salt into the wounds is from the corner. They just go away and score a breakaway goal. which um, and I've never seen a game end like that, ever. Um, that was it. Ball hit the back of net. Referee blew the whistle. Game over. You should watch more ice hockey, Chris. It happens there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they pull the goalkeeper. But they 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 take them completely off the off the well, not the pitch, but the uh, off the ice, don't they? Yeah, they do. They bring on an extra forward. No, that's what Ulreich basically did. But um, yeah, Gasinovic with the breakaway. Um, in German, they said 70 meter in the Unendlichkeit. Um, 70 meters, uh, uh, 70 meters of, of, of running towards the cup final to win it all. Um, that's the, the that's the distance Kasinovic sprinted, and uh, like Rabbit, he kept on sprinting, and I think he actually jumped into the into the Frankfurt block, didn't he, Chris? And that that, that was it. That was game over. And then all of a sudden, the Frankfurt fans were on the pitch. Um, it, it was it was such a dramatic finish to the game. Uh, I know it ruined your prediction. Um, I think you had it nailed down at 2-1, and then, of course, Gazinovic, um ruined it for you. Um, I think you still still can claim it, though, Chris. I I think, you know, taking away that, that empty net goal uh, is still pretty good to, to predict it 2-1, because that's essentially what it was, wasn't it? Well, it was 3-1, but, yeah, I mean, I'd even forgotten that goal went in at the end, didn't I? I said, oh, yes, the yeah, prediction was right. You like, the third goal went in. I was like, oh, yes. It was. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a brilliant game, and, and that topped it off. I think that was the level of, of just what uh, of the whole game from start to finish. It was one of the quickest cup finals I've ever been to. Normally, they tend to drag a bit, but this one just seemed to fly by. Yeah, fantastic. Eh? Well, what, what's an end to Nico Kovac's reign there? I, I think he's done a fantastic job, and I'd imagine that the Frankfurt fans are, are extremely pleased. I mean, last season they finished 11th with 42 points. We've seen progress in the league, didn't we? They're moving up to 8th 
and, and finishing on 49 points and then obviously you're leaving with um, with a title like this. It, it's fantastic. But let's talk about the aftermath for uh, both clubs. And uh, Chris, we'll go to you. Um, how do you see um, how do you see uh, him getting on at Bayern? We've discussed it previously, haven't we? But um, he's got a lot of big names to go in and deal with. Um, as you mentioned, this this cup win can only do him good. But uh, Rummenigger and Honis aren't exactly on the same page, are they? So so that could be tricky for him. Yeah, he needs a good start. Um, I think that's essential. If he has any sort of poor start, I think there may be knives out for him from certain sections within Bayern themselves and within the Bayern-based media that could come out um, sooner rather than later. I don't think... I don't think he's going to have a bad time. I like him. I think he knows the club. I think he gets the way the club plays. I thought it was very um, very gentlemanly in his conduct the way after. Took time to spend and talk to the Bayern guy. Spoke to Muller at great length, probably about next season. Um, so it was nice to see. I I think he'll do all right, you know. Um, after, after predicting um, Tedesco getting a sack after five match days, he should really be wary about giving coaches tips. But... I think on this particular one, I think Kovac will do well at Bayern. Now, whether they go and win everything is a different matter. Uh, he will need to have a good presence in the Bundesliga and the Champions League, no doubt. But both Manu and I got the feeling, especially after that Frankfurt win, that German football may be changing now with Bayern getting a little older. And they didn't win the three cups that they thought they would. You know, They didn't make the Champions League final. Um, they were a little humbled in Berlin by Frankfurt and, well, the league was a stroll at the end, wasn't it? You'd expect maybe the teams around them that weren't as hot to be a lot hotter next season, especially after the managerial changes at Dortmund, captaincy changes, etc. Um, so I think um, Kovac will do OK. Now, he needs a good season. If he has one good season, um, I think he will grow into it. It's just whether he's given that time. Well, yeah, this is it. I mean, Manu, I think we need to also... Um... Maybe break down whether it was um, a disappointing season for Bayern. I mean, just to win the league, a lot of other leagues around the world, you say, no, that that's that's a successful one and getting to a cup final. But I mean, you you did say at different points that you fancied them to get a uh, treble. And to be honest, we it, it was hard to argue against that. But it seems to have just uh, fallen away from uh, Heinkes uh, in the in the last few months. No, you know, look, um, they still reached the final of the cup. They came with an, a whisker of, of reaching the Champions League final. Um, we, we cannot forget that. And, um, by and large, I think they are still among the top three clubs in Europe. Um, they just happened to go out against a side that on, on the two legs had th- that extra centimeter of more that it takes to win. Um, and get get to the final. Whether Real will win it, the final will find out soon enough. Um, but look, this was still an extraordinary season for them. Um, I think though, I think though, Frankfurt have, <laughs> and this, this this could be an interesting one for Kovac because I think Kovac provided now the blueprint on how to beat Bayern. Um, and of course, he's going to be at Bayern next year, so he he will have to. Sort of find a blueprint against his own blueprint, so to speak, because I think there is, there is a way to beat the side. And this, the way to beat the side is to, um, to be confident about yourself and to be confident in your beliefs and to have character. I mean, <laughs> Kevin Prince bore a tank and he could have really, he could have really stumbled over this, um, in the final, had himself on the title page of the sport build. Hold, putting the, his arm around the cup and saying, hands off Bayern, this cup is mine. This was days before the final. And I think it's, this is something that, that clubs have to now realize. It's like, look, um, a lot of the clubs in German football have been way too humble when it comes to Bayern's dominance. That needs to change. You need more character players and more characters like Boateng would say, like, yes, this is a one-off game. And a one-off game, you can beat a bigger side. Now, if all other 17 clubs in German football actually try to do that, there will be more stumbles by Bayern. And as a result, a more exciting league. Because they are beatable. 
on every given day, that's a, they, they are beatable as a team. Um, it's just that I think if a lot of the teams play too defensive and um, they do not play play their own football when they play against Bayern, and I think that is something that needs to change in terms of um, mentality that is, that is going has been happening in German football for the last six years. And that's this is what I meant when I said to Chris, I think this is this could be a catalyst for something that could bring about a change because now clubs know, look, this team is beatable. Yeah, definitely. It, I mean, it would only benefit the the league, wouldn't it? You know, if if it was a little closer. I mean, the uh, this last season, you know, we we've seen uh, Bayern kind of cruise it, as uh, as Chris rightfully said. Um, guys, let's talk a little bit about what's the next step for Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, they've app- appointed a new coach, an Austrian, at the name of Andy Hüder. Is that is that right? I hope it's right. Andy Hütter. Oh, my bad. Um, <laughs> I'm never going to win with these pronunciations, am I? But anyway, let, let's talk a little bit um, about him. The 48-year-old uh, was uh, managing uh, young boys. Uh, they managed to win the Swiss Super League this season. And now he moves on to Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, Manu, what can you tell us uh, about Andy? I think Frankfurt got the perfect uh, replacement for Kovac. Um, I'm actually really excited about this appointment because here's a guy who managed um, Red Bull Salzburg. He's from the Red Bull Salzburg football system. He was at their academy as well. Then did very well in the Bundesliga second division, uh, or Bundesliga 2 as it's also called in Austria. And um, did some really good things there. Really fantastic things, actually. And um, plays a really aggressive attacking style of football, you know, typical RB football. Um, he then had a fallout with Rangnick, um, Rangnick and fallouts, and you know, this seems to be a common theme. Um, and left the club and moved to Young Boys, where, um, after three years of work, he finally managed to win Young Boys their first title in 30, over 30 years. Um, dethroning Basel, a side that dominated Swiss football the same way that Bayern dominates German football. And he did this over a long process of time playing um, his football, but being very adaptable in, in, in his football. Um, so I'm very excited about him as a coach. I had my some doubts because he plays in a 4-2-2-2 formation, um, similar to RB Leipzig and, and Salzburg, of course. Um, and Frankfurt currently don't play with four on the back. But then, of course, then I watched the cup final, and that's exactly what they did. They played with four on the back, and they did just fine. So I think, I think this is going to be an appointment that's going to work out very well for Frankfurt. And I think now with being them and being the Europa League, a current cup winner, they're going to be able to build on the side rather than losing key pieces. Yeah, fantastic um, achievements uh, by him at Young Boys. I mean, we've seen him win the league this season, as you said, their, their first um, domestic title in, in quite some time, but by 15 points as well. You know, that, that is fantastic. Uh, uh, very quickly, Chris, just as we uh, come to the end of the podcast, do you feel that um, Eintracht uh, Frankfurt have appointed the right man? I mean, I mean, how do you see them getting on in in the coming season? I think only time will tell if they've uh, appointed the right coach, but you can't argue with his background. I mean, he won the League and Cup double, didn't he, with uh, his only tie, his only year season in charge at Salzburg. And let's not forget that. Um, he can achieve the same this coming weekend on the 27th. Yes, this week is it this weekend. Yeah, it's 27th, 27th of May in the Swiss Cup, so he could bow out with a double. So Frankfurt could be getting, you know, a two times double winner. Um, I think Manu's right. His system may be one that he has to adapt, but you know, all good coaches will adapt their system if required to the players they have. Uh, he'll have to somewhere like Frankfurt because they, unfortunately, <laughs> they don't have the millions and millions of pounds needed or euros to go out and completely refit the side he'll have to play with what he's got and I think his his experience um, both with Salzburg and with young boys will be invaluable especially taking uh, them into the Europa League next year so um, only time will tell Bryce if they've appointed the right person but I think if you're a Frankfurt fan you can be really excited about next season going into next season as the Pokal winners and going into Europe yeah, I must say, I, I think I'm like you two fellas. I'm excited to see just how this one pans out. So it's always good to get a bit of flesh, fresh blood into the uh, league, I feel. But guys, that more or less does it uh, for this week. That, and that more or less wraps up this season. Um, Manu, what have you got coming up that you'd like to draw people's attention to? 
Yeah, I'm in Poland at the moment. I'm going to speak at the uh, Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding here in Warsaw um, tomorrow evening, or I guess by the evening, the time this podcast comes out. So this is Wednesday. Um, the event is at six o'clock. Um, yeah, there's, I'll tweet out the link and etc. If you're interested, if you are in Poland and you're interested in, in coming and uh, hear me speak about the political implications of Russia's World Cup. Um, there's there's a couple of other big name journalists. Pavel Vilkovich, who is one of the biggest journalists in, in Poland, is at the event. He's tweeted our our articles and podcasts in the past. He's a he's a very very interesting interesting guy. He's a very interesting person. Um, he will be at the event too. So yeah, that's what basically what I'm I'm doing. So if you if you're interested in checking that out, I will tweet out details. or already have tweeted out the details um, at my Twitter account at Banuelvef. Fantastic stuff, and uh, good luck and enjoy it, I suppose. Um, Chris, uh, what have you got coming up? I think you're probably rather excited about the weekend ahead. Well, I too, Bryce, am going to Warsaw, but only for a little bit. I'm flying into Warsaw on Thursday to get a train to Kiev, where I'll arrive, fri- well, I'll arrive Friday morning for... Um, there's a small game going on in Kiev on Saturday night, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's it. Whatever could he be talking about, eh? Uh, but yeah, guys, thanks for uh, tuning in uh, to the podcast. As always, it's been a fantastic season. We will um, all come together once again to do a bit of a well, a, a bit of a season summary uh, podcast uh, in the uh, coming days or week. Um, so yeah, l- look forward to that. So we're not quite done for the season just yet, but uh, we do appreciate you all uh, tuning in and listening. Uh, to the podcast we 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 really do um enjoy doing it and if you'd like to get in touch you do via football grad live on twitter or contact any of our twitter handles and yeah we'll we'll try and um pick up the topics that you would like discussed or or yeah if you've got any feedback for us um yeah please uh send it via twitter or go to wherever you find the podcast and leave us some kind words if you could guys that that more or less does it i suppose um yeah, don't, don't really know what to say. Um, I suppose our readers in. Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb sein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht, komm dir entgegen, ich hab zu holen. Let's be real. Dealing with tangled cords can make it harder to do your hair. Break free with the new Unbound Cordless Auto Curler from Conair. Get the curls and waves you want, anytime, anywhere. It's designed to let you experience the power and freedom of beauty in motion. No cords to hold you back. You get your curls and waves your way. Unplug and be unbound. Loose curls, tight curls, beachy waves. The Unbound Cordless Auto Curler makes it easy to get the looks you love. Love your look. Live Unbound. Available at conair.com and search Unbound. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.